on education and our kids. All right, we are live. Hi, welcome. My name is Jessica Smith. I'm a children's librarian here at Euclid Public Library. I am delighted to present tonight's event, a conversation with Jewel Parker Rhodes. This event is part of our One Community Reads Racial Equity in America series sponsored by the following libraries in Cuyahoga County, Cleveland Public Library, Cuyahoga County Public Library, East Cleveland Public Library, Euclid Public Library, Heights Libraries, Lakewood Public Library, Shaker Library, and Westlake Porter Public Library. Visit onecommunityreads.org to see all of the program offerings. Before I introduce our guest, we would love to have your feedback tonight on the event. We will be posting a survey link into the comments section on Facebook Live and take a few minutes to complete the survey at the conclusion of the event. Your feedback is valuable and we will use it to determine um, future programs. If you have any questions for Dr. Rhodes during the event, submit them in Facebook and we will get to them as many as we can as there is time. And now to introduce Jewel Parker Rhodes. She currently serves as the Piper Endowed Chair and Founding Artistic Director of the Virginia G. Piper Center for Creative Writing at Arizona State University. Her most recent uh, middle grade novel, Black Brother, Black Brother, was published in March of this year. 2018's Ghost Boys quickly became a New York Times bestseller and has garnered over 25 awards and honors, including the Walter Award, the Indies Choice E.B. White Read Aloud Award, and the Jane Addams Children's Book Award for Older Readers. Jewel is also the author of Towers Falling, winner of the 2017 Notable Books for a Global Society, and the celebrated Louisiana Girls Trilogy, Ninth Ward, a winner of a Coretta Scott King Honor Award, Sugar, a Junior Library Guild selection, and Bayou Magic, a We Need Diverse Books educational selection. Jewel has written numerous children's and adult books, hoping to inspire social justice, equality, and environmental stewardship. She enjoys teaching, walking her toy Aussie sheepdogs, theater, dancing, and music. Born in Pittsburgh, she now lives in Seattle. Welcome, Jewel. Thank you very, very much. And to the wonderful library system, uh, the Cuyahoga system, is that how you pronounce it? Thank you so <laughs> much. I didn't know that it was a whole big united effort. And I am honored because I love librarians and actually libraries and librarians were so important to my childhood. My family was very poor. We couldn't afford books. And it was the librarians who kept my soul fed because whenever I finished a book, they had another one that they handed to me. So thank you for current and current librarians and thank you for all the ancestor librarians. <laughs> now today I'm gonna to talk about Ghost Boys and Black Brother, Black Brother. Let's start with Ghost Boys. This book um, was is really dear to my heart. And the reason why it's now dear to my heart is because it's been so well received by youth. But when I was asked by my editor to write this book, she literally said, Jewel, do you want to write about the murder of Black youth? And I said, no. And I said, no, 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 for about a three month period. And what made me finally say, I'll try, is that I thought you, the youth, deserved a space, a safe place to talk about racism, racial bias in your schools, with your teachers, your librarians, and also with your parents. And I had a pact with my editor that if I didn't get the book right, if it wasn't good enough, we just simply wouldn't publish it because you as young people deserve my very best. You deserve society's very best efforts. The other reason why I finally decided to write about Ghost Boys was the fact that when I was a little girl, Emmett Till was murdered. And Emmett Till's murder sort of became a visual image of racism in my mind as a child. And even from the time that I was a toddler to now as a grandmother, I am still haunted by the image of Emmett Till's death. 
I also wanted to answer the question historically or try to pose it for readers to think about. Why is it when I was a little girl, an innocent black child was murdered by two white racists and now I'm a grandmother and we have Tamir Rice, Trayvon Martin, Philando Castile, all other youth under the age of 18 who are also being murdered. Why haven't we changed as a society? And I'm gonna share my screen with you to give you some background in history. Okay. Here's Ghost Boys. And here is Emmett Till. This is a picture of Emmett when he was 14 years old. And he actually begged his mother in Chicago to let him go down to Mississippi to live with his cousins for the summer and to be, you know, just a joyful, playful child. And his mother didn't want to let him go. But finally, she said yes. And Emmett went to Mississippi. And four days after he was there, Emmett Till was murdered. He was kidnapped from his uncle's home. Um, he was beaten and thrown into the river. When Emmett's body was, dis was discovered, the only way that his uncle could recognize him was by a ring on his finger. Now, Emmett supposedly, in terms of web searches, in terms of books written for adults, books written for, for children, talk about how he must have done something sassy or inappropriate. And the white woman, Miss Carolyn Bryant, who owned this candy store, this dry goods store, she said that he had been arrogant and that he had assaulted her and pushed her up against a wall. In my heart of hearts, I thought, no, he would be innocent. 14 year old kids, it wouldn't behave inappropriately to adults. And even if he had done something that was inappropriate, that's no excuse for a child, any child, to be hurt or abused. Actually, Emmett did absolutely nothing wrong. And all the materials that you'll find in terms of research history have been wrong for over 50 years. Miss Bryant, about several years ago when she was 82, finally confessed that he did nothing. He was not inappropriate. The only thing he did was say goodbye. And for that, he was murdered. Now, Emmett's mom, Miss Mamie Till, and that's her, and she uh, is over her son's casket. And I'm not going to show you the picture. If you decide you want to see the picture, you should ask your school teacher, your parents' permission, and have them uh, be with you. I prefer to remember Emmett as the smiling, bright, young child he once was. But Mamie Till said, send me my son's body back. And Mississippi didn't want to do that. They wanted to keep the body. They were ashamed, maybe, of what had happened or afraid of the impact of Emmett's murder. But Mrs. Till persisted. She got the body back to Chicago. And then when she had her son's body, her relatives said, don't look in the casket. Don't see what they've done to your son. And she said, no, I want to see what they've done to my boy. And when she saw her son's body, she screamed that I want the entire world to see what they have done to my boy. And because of that courage to share her son's death with the world, the civil rights movement was set afire. It became a great catalyst what she did was bear witness that she took her pain and said, let's take this pain and use it to make things better for all. And that was how the civil rights movement began in America. And you had Martin Luther King beginning his speeches, beginning his advocacy for equity and social justice. And you had marches with Martin and his wife, Coretta, Coretta King. And you can see in the marches that there were people from all religions, all generations, all colors, rising up to say, children, Black people uh, should be treated fairly. 
we had Rosa Parks saying, you know, I'm not going to sit in the back of the bus anymore. And that was, yes, um, you know, an advocacy for fair treatment. Malcolm X in the middle on the very top row, he started telling about the pride of black nationalism. Be proud of your blackness. And the three gentlemen who were at the 1968 Mexico City Olympics, you have two raising the black power sign. And that's Juan Smith and no, Juan Carlos and Tommy Smith. One won a gold medal in track, another won a bronze medal in track. And they were very proud to be Americans. They were very proud to represent Americans. I've actually had a chance to say and seek to see them, you know, as an adult when I was living in California. And the Black Power sign wasn't about disrespect. It was about saying, you know, we still have a ways to go to fulfill the promise of equity, equity of America. So that reminds me of the protests by Colin Kerpenek in the NFL. Kneeling doesn't mean that they disrespect the flag or disrespect our servicemen. They're saying, let's fulfill the promise of America. So Ghost Boys is about bearing witness. In my novel, I try to take the pain and turn it into something that will motivate you to make the world a better place. And one of the things that my character Jerome says in the novel is only the living can make the world better. So live and make it better. Now I'm gonna read for you the opening of my book. When I write, I have to hear the character's voice. And once I can do that, I can tell the story. So this is chapter one. Jerome is playing with a toy gun, which is a very American thing to do. We are a nation of guns uh, and playing toy with toy guns, police roles, uh, cops and robbers, you know. And so he's being a kid playing with a toy gun and this happens. How small I look, laid out flat, my stomach touching ground my right knee bent and my brand new Nike stained with blood. I stoop and stare at my face, my right cheek flattened on concrete. My eyes are wide open, my mouth too, I'm dead. I thought I was bigger, but I'm just a bit of nothing. My arms are outstretched like I was trying to fly like Superman. I'd barely turn, legs gave way. Pow, pow, I fell flat, hard. I hit snowy ground. Ma's running, she's wailing. My boy, my boy, a policeman holds her back. Another policeman is standing over me, murmuring. It's a kid, it's a kid. Ma's struggling. She gasps like she can't breathe. She falls to her knees and screams. I can't bear the sound. Sirens wail. Other cops are coming. Did someone call an ambulance? I'm still dead, alone on the field. The policeman closest to me is rubbing his head. In his hand, his gun dangles. The other policeman is watching Ma like she's going to hurt someone. Then he shouts, stay back. People are edging closer, snapping pictures, taking video with their phones. Stay back. The policeman's hand covers his holster. More people come. Some shout, I hear my name. Jerome. It's Jerome. Still. Everyone stays back. Some curse, some cry. Doesn't seem fair. Nobody ever paid me any attention. I skated by, kept my head low. Now, I'm famous. I'm going to share with you 
one more thing. Okay. Why are you following me? Why my hoodie makes me look suspicious? Why does my music make me dangerous? Why are people that are supposed to protect me attacking me? Why are you afraid of me? I just think I'm dangerous. Why do I afraid of people who are supposed to protect me? Why can't I make a peace sign without you labeling the game sign? Why does standing on the ground only work when I'm on the ground? Why do you show this photo over this one? Why do you only stop and fist me? Why do you have low expectations for me? Why can't I run down the street without causing alarms? Why do you think I'm a thug? Why do you assume I'm on? Why can I break? Why is my mom scared every time I leave the house? Why are you targeting me? Why am I a target? Why? 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 I know why. And it has to stop. It must stop. Because I have dreams. Because I can change the world. Because I'll make a difference. Because I have a feeling. Because I am strong. Because I am talented. I have a voice. I can find a cure. I have goals. I can lead the country. I am determined. I have a future. Because I'm a scholar. I am powerful. I'm someone's friend. I'm someone's brother. I'm someone's son. So I love it. And because my life matters too. My life matters. 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 All lives matter. And so did theirs. Now, one of the things that happened to me personally is that after I had written Ghost Boys, um, I felt an uplift in my spirits because of youth response. But since the murder of George Floyd, I've also been grateful to students who reached out to me to say that they want to start a new civil rights advocacy. So I feel in my lifetime, we're gonna have two ways, we're having two ways of social justice. After Emmett died in my generation, we fought for greater civil rights and had lots of success, but we didn't finish the job. And now I know from words, thoughts, stories, poems you've written to me that you're engaged in a second wave of civil rights. And so that America is continuing to fulfill its promise, the promise made by our founding fathers of liberty, justice, and equality for all. Ghost Boys, I also felt honored in a way that I felt I could express my own personal story. Now I'm gonna show you very quickly pictures of my family. Okay. I happened to marry long, long time ago. We've been married 35 years. This tall white guy, you can see him bending over because he's like 6'4". And we had two beautiful children. And as you can see, my son looks like me. He's brown skin. And my daughter looks like her dad. And very often when I would be out with my daughter, people would think that I was her nanny, um, that I was babysitting her. And when my husband was out with his son, people would say, oh, it's so nice that you've adopted a black kid. But nobody seemed to put us all together. But if you sort of made us all one shade or just look at our features, you can see we're family together. And that identity is not superficial. It's not, you know, hair, skin color, eye color. It's really genetically how human beings all over the world are connected. Color is a myth. Color as 
a racial separation is a myth. And there's a woman named Angelica Das who is doing a project where she's trying to document all the human skin tones. And so far, she has documented that there are over 4,000 human skin tones. So the idea that somebody is just black or brown or white doesn't make any sense. We are all united genetically. We are all the same family in our hearts, minds, and spirits. It's just externally, we look different and unique from one another. Now in writing Black Brother, Black Brother, I also expose the school to prison pipeline. So Ghost Boys is about the racial bias and racism that might exist within some police offices, officers, and police stations. The school to prison pipeline is about how in some schools there might exist racism and racial bias. And in fact, uh, since the zero tolerance policies of the George Bush administration came into our schools, it's more likely, and this has been documented through statistics, that children of color are more harshly punished more harshly suspended than similarly white kids, even if it's the same thing. And then there are some cases that are absolutely ridiculous, like one kid who had gotten his free lunch and forgot to get his milk. And when he went back to go get it, what did they do? They arrested him. Now, every time a young child of color is suspended or arrested and sent to juvenile detention, the chances that they'll graduate from high school lessen and the chances that they'll end up being in the criminal justice system increases. So actually, this book, Black Brother, Black Brother, and I'm going to stop sharing now, is really based on how I experienced my children being treated differently. My daughter was beloved and seen as the good kid. My son, who was also a wonderful good kid, when he turned 12 in schools, people started looking at him much more suspiciously. And in fact, one day he was at school and he was just being a moody middle grader and they called me to come get him. And I was told that the next time he was moody that they were going to call the police. It's like, what? Um, it was crazy. But here's black brother, black brother. And you see two brothers, one is white skinned, one is dark skinned. And this book is about how at a school, the darker skinned brother gets bullied. Uh, but through it, all, through it all, the two brothers stay close. Just as through it all, my family, we stayed close. Even though racism and bias tried to tear us apart, we held close and tight together with our love, which is what I recommend to everyone, no matter what. Um, I hope you get a chance to read Black Brother, Black Brother. And here's a secret too. Black Brother, Black Brother is a sports book. It's about fencing. When I was a little girl, I loved swords, all kinds of swords. And I discovered that Alexander Dumas, the man who wrote The Three Musketeers, The Count of Monte Cristo, he was a Black Frenchman. But when I watched the movies or read books, I saw all those fencers as being white. And it's not so because Alexander Dumas was writing about his dad the Black Count who became the great general in Napoleon's army. He was considered the greatest swordsman of all time. And right now we have an Olympic team that is very much mixed race. And I'm writing about how Dante, the darker brother, takes up fencing because a kid that bullies him is a white fencer. He's captain of the team and Dante wants to win at his own game, at his own game. He wants to defeat him. But ultimately, Dante realizes that it's not revenge that he, he wants. He wants to be himself. And he learns that even if other people don't see him clearly, even if other people try to stereotype him, he knows that he is glorious. So Dante's message to you, my message to you is to be you always, even if others can't see you. That's their problem, not yours.
So now I am ready for questions. Thank you so much for sharing the videos and, and the passage from the book. Um, I just uh, re-listened to Black Brother, Black Brother um, and audio. I'm a huge audiobook fan. Me and um, I wondered about the, the process for audiobooks. I know Tower Spalling, um, you narrated, correct? Mm -hmm. And um, and then uh, this is uh, by a gentleman. Do you get any say in the process? Do you get to listen to them beforehand or how does that work? Um, yes, they usually will send me a sampling of different narrators' voices. Um, and I get to you know put in my two cents about who I think would be able to do the best job. But after that, they turn into their own artistic program and they create their own artistic work. Generally, um, I've been very happy with the audiobooks. There was only one time where I was like, oh no, that I wasn't crazy about it. And that was a long time ago, but I don't get much, much of a say in terms of the final product. Okay. Um, so uh, beforehand, we were talking about how you became a writer and um, so it sounded like you always kind of knew that's the direction that you were heading in. Um, but there, was actually, there a moment? No, oh, go actually ahead. what you just said is, is not true. Oh, okay. Wow. Now, everyone who is a young person now, when I was growing up, we did not have diverse books. We did not have diverse authors or any authors coming to the poor school that I grew up in in Pittsburgh. My school was pretty segregated. We were primarily an all black school, but all the teachers I ever had were white uh, librarians, white teachers. And of course they were wonderful. They saved my, my life. But all the books that I read were also by white authors about white experiences. And they also made me um, more empathetic. And they also taught me not just about white culture, but they also taught me about being a human being. So those books were enormously wonderful and helpful. And though I wrote though all the time, because I didn't see myself in my books, I didn't see myself um, you know, in books that I read. And actually now that I'm a teacher, I didn't see myself as even thinking of being a teacher because I didn't see any teachers of color. I didn't think it was something I could do. So from kindergarten through 12th grade, not a single book by a person that wasn't either from, you know, uh, the United Kingdom or America that was white. And in college, eight years of college, I was never assigned a book by anybody from Pakistan or South Africa um, or Mexico. They were still white authors. And one day when I was a junior in college, I went into the library and I happened to see on the shelf a book, but that was written by a black woman about the African slave trade. And it was like, whoa, black women write books? I wanna do that. And I switched my major to English and launched my career. So everybody needs to see themselves. Everybody needs to hear their story told. You need to know that once there was less diversity and you need to fight and advocate for more diversity so that everybody has a chance to discover what they can be. I almost missed it simply because I didn't see myself anywhere. Yeah, um, Jason Reynolds had talked recently about how important it is for kids to see themselves on the bookshelves. And there is a huge movement of um, own voices and we need diverse books, but um, you know, as a librarian, we know much, much more is needed. Um, are there some authors that you could suggest um, that um, people may not know about or? Oh, okay. I would like to suggest, and, and I know you guys know a lot, a lot of wonderful authors because you have wonderful librarians, <laughs> but there is a book by Janae Marks called From the Desk of Zoe Washington. And it's about a girl uh, whose father is incarcerated and she loves to bake and make cake books. It's a delightful, wonderful book. There is also a book that's coming out very shortly by Andrea Davis Pinckney and Brian Pinckney, which I actually did a review for called Loretta Little Looks Back. 
and it's a book of drawings and poems and speeches and scenes all about how a generation of sharecroppers went from one generation to a second to a third and fought for the right to vote for African Americans. There's another book that's coming out, which maybe the librarians don't know about just yet. And that's by an author called Leslie Youngblood. And her book is called Forever This Summer. And it's about three little girls who decide that they're gonna earn money and have a talent show to help rescue their community from um, a kind of depression, a recession, and also to help fund Alzheimer's research. So those are three that maybe are not as well known right. because they're not out yet. Okay. <laughs> That's always the benefit, right? Of yes, <laughs> getting yes. to the blurb. Um, so we have a question um, from a viewer. Uh, can you tell us about your decision to make a parallel between the police and Jerome's bullies at school and Ghost Boys? Oh, interesting. Um, you know, I actually, in terms of that as a, as a parallel, I think it just grew uh, out organically. The important thing to note for both groups um, is that the young bullies, they change. They learn to respect Carlos, respect Kim, and that they have growth as a character. And I am not saying that all police officers are bullies, but I think that bullying can be related to bias. It's that idea that you see somebody as less than and that you have a right to feel yourself superior to them. I think the man who murdered George Floyd was in fact, you know, not just a bully, but really something much more outrageous. The bully is too, too kind, of, kind of word in my opinion. But even so, whether you're a young youth with, who bullies or a police adult that might have bias or any adult that might have a bias, Sarah's dad also changes. He opens up the communication too with his daughter or Sierra invites him in. And I love that moment when um, they hug one another and Jerome is watching. So for me, it's not about demonizing anyone. It's about providing knowledge, moments for empathy, um, you know, taking time for each of us to make our own journey towards awareness. And I think that's what all the characters do. So unfortunately, kids have, well, unfortunately, adults should have more awareness, right? And in some ways, adults can get stuck in their assumptions and get stuck in their ways. So I want adults to also remember to challenge yourself or to stop and think. So for example, I remember there's a video of a father who had adopted a young black girl and he also had a white daughter. And so he's proud of both his daughters. And he said one day he was, you know, getting ready to go to work and he saw a young white woman sitting at a bench and then saw two black guys approaching her way. And he said to himself, let me stop, you know, let me, let me see if something's going to go awry. And then immediately he said, what am I thinking? You know, that's the insidiousness of, of bias, that that's the insidiousness of how we can be acculturated and not even know it. So adults, definitely check yourselves. Kids, I think, naturally do check themselves. They have such good hearts. And the bullies, I think, come out of a sense of insecurity for how they're developing or unsure of themselves. And they have this opportunity to grow and they are, are growing, but they are excusable in terms of their needing to grow. I mean, that's that we all need to grow, but I would say, you know, okay, let's make a, um, a big hug helping children towards that point, a big hug helping adults towards further growth, but also because you're an adult, you have a responsibility to help your own growth, to educate yourself about anything and everything that still might perplex you or that you think will help make you a better, more humane and loving person. Boy, did I get off on a roll on that? I'm sorry. I'm it's perfect. I'm, it's perfect. I'm sorry, but I, I've never been asked that question before in that way. Um, and I do want to make it clear. Uh, 
everybody still needs to keep growing. And if I can say at 67 that I am imperfect and I am still growing, you know, uh, and keep working on it, that that is for me and the world I live in a good thing. And I have an obligation to help the seven, eight, 12, 14 year old to help them grow. Not that they can be just like me, but that they can be their best selves and be somebody that they are proud of. We can differ, have different ideas, different opinions, you know, but our culture thrives on civil discourse among unique people who believe what they believe in and when their beliefs are tested, either decide to reject them or to keep them. But when we are leading a secondhand life, just having the sense of, oh, that's what I've been taught or that's what I see on TV. That's like you're getting all your ideas secondhand. So I tell my college students, what you wanna do is live a firsthand life, that what you believe in is really what you believe in. And that's what Sarah does in Ghost Boys. She loves her dad, but she says, I'm gonna disagree with you. I'm gonna communicate with you. I'm gonna respect you. I'm gonna love you, but I am not going to accept perhaps that sense of bias that you may, may have. Yeah, I, I found, I read um, this scene to a class today with uh, Sarah building a website and Jerome talking with her um, as she's such a powerful force in that book, um, but only through Jerome. Uh, and, and what I've noticed in your books is the kids ask hard questions and they're not afraid to ask those questions and um, to challenge the adults in their yes. lives. <laughs> yeah. it, <laughs> that I think sometimes we need to let the youth lead us, that yeah. they have uh, better ideas and better empathy. But I also want to point out that all of my books have multi-ethnic characters. And some people have asked me, well, why does Sarah get to see the ghosts? And that's because Sarah has a good heart. Sarah is not racist. Sarah does not have racially biased. And I think it's important to recognize that there are tons of white people and white kids who are just so loving and ready to make the world even better. And they're just, you know, into fairness and equity. And then there's Carlos, who's Latino, you know, and he makes alliances and the African American. It's a multi ethnic society. And just like those pictures of Martin Luther King and his wife marching with a coalition of people, we don't we don't want to just have African Americans advocating for Af being African American or in the suffragette movement. You know, it didn't really gain its power until it also went from women and expanded to a much more universal coalition. We need everybody to come together and speak truth to power. Yeah, that reminds me of um, at the beginning of Black Brother, Black Brother, Dante is sitting in the office and is in one side of his head, he hears his mom saying, speak truth to power. <laughs> and on the other side, his dad um, saying, but respectfully. Yes. <laughs> that really, you know, I felt that turmoil um, as the reader, as he's sitting there. And what, what did that mean? What do you think that meant to Dante at that moment? You know, I think he's, I think one, children want to make their parents proud and they do listen to wise things from their parents, of course. And to be respectful is something that we want all of our kids to be, you know, to be respectful. But sometimes if you're being respectful and you keep hidden truths or aren't really communicating your inner self, if you aren't speaking truth to power, then you're missing opportunities to make the world better. And I think for a lot of people who are hurt in so many different kinds of ways, it's hard, but particularly can you imagine for a child to straddle the line to say, this is not right, respectfully. And it might there might be a time um, when, you know, they might get very heated and not be so respectful, but I like it akin to our current protests. Our current protests work when they're peaceful, when they're respectful. The moment that we're not 
respectful or get violent, then it becomes something else. But that demand is particularly difficult on a child, but children do it all the time. So anytime you see an adult who can't speak their truth respectfully, I think we should call them on it. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, we did have a comment um, from a student um, and they said, this is so amazing. I really appreciate this. I was told to come here for school because this is the book that we were reading and I'm really enjoying it. So thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna give you a heart and a, and a big hug and thank you very much um, to, to all of you. And if you ever want to email me through my website, you're happy to do so. Um, to me, literally in this time of COVID and time of racial unrest, what makes me so happy is just knowing that you exist in the world, you know? And I want every single one of you to realize that right now there are young children, like my granddaughter, there are children being born all over the world and they are waiting for you for when you become adults in just a few short years, you're gonna be 18, getting married, going to college, joining the services, voting, voting, voting. And so in some sense, I can't, wait until your generation grows up um, because I know you're gonna finally fulfill America's promise of racial equality. So feel your power, you know, feel good about yourself. And if somebody says or suggests you don't matter, pshwa, tell them Dr. Rhodes said that's not true. There are children not even born yet for whom you are gonna matter a great deal. And my next book is actually gonna be on climate change and it's actually about the California wildfires. Oh, wow. So I hope you young people too help with that. That's so awesome. Um, I was thinking um, in Black Brother, Black Brother, Dante's story um, could have gone so differently being arrested. Um, for something um, that wouldn't have been an issue if he were his brother Trey, possibly. Yes. Um, yes. And then I recently read a book um, called uh, Punching the Air, which is loosely based on um, the Central Park Five, where okay. a boy was arrested for um, hitting somebody when they were in a fight, and he ended up in the prison system. Uh -huh. um, and I thought, you know, is it because of Dante's uh, white father and his lawyer mother that his story is different than other um, kids in that situation. I think to a certain extent that is absolutely true. Um, it's been uh, my own personal experience. Um, soon as you say, you know, um, somebody says something negative about my son, you know, and then Dr. Rhodes comes and it's like, what? You know, well, let's talk about this and argue about that. Also, I think class is a divider for all of us and it's unfortunate, but particularly in terms of education, it can be a divider. There's kids that have a lot of resources in their schools and the kids that don't. And a lot of the kids that are sent off to the criminal justice system go to schools where they don't have a lot of resources, that they're really not really as much um, geared all the time towards providing the enrichment because they don't have the resources. So if they don't have the resources and then also the parents don't have the resources, it's really easy for our whole system, a criminal justice system to sort of, you know, just take over. And it's like, what's going on? It's akin to, you know, not having enough money to have great representation. It's akin to not having enough money to say, you know, well, even though you say I don't need a lawyer, which they often say in juvenile court, that you can have one anyway, or for somebody to be literate enough to read the documents to understand what does this mean? Or it's somebody who has the confidence despite, um, you know, whatever, background they have to literally say, wait, you know, I know I was taught to respect my teachers, uh, but I have enough confidence and enough education to sort of like, no, let's just, let's discuss this. Let me see if I can think of it as a, as another, um, another way of su suggesting that I think there's systemic racism and there is systemic 
um, disadvantages for children of color and also all children who are poor or belong in rural communities that don't have equal access to the internet and enrichment materials. And that then translates into the how a family is working and is busy working, can't keep an eye on everything, believes what the school says. It just changes the power dynamic where you're not raising a child together, but that you be, maybe become for some parents, not all, and, and forgive the generalities, please, that you become cowered by the weight of the system and you have other children to take care of and there's the weight of the system. It's, it's just horrific. But I would recommend reading Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson, okay? The movie, good movie, not nearly as good as the book. Um, the book is tremendous. And at the very end of the book, Stevenson gives a sort of brief intro, well, a brief explanation for how the system of suppression has led to dis unfair advantages uh, for the poor and African-Americans historically. And it's absolutely brilliant. You should read that. There's also a just mercy um, that is for children. You know, there's a youth, a youth edition, but Stevenson documents over and over again, innocent black people innocent, you know, poor rural white people who are institutionalized jail 20, 30 years simply because there is no means or people work against them because of stereotypical ideas. So those books um, are really nonfiction and they speak to the facts. Another fact that I want to just say when you also look at American history and inequity in education, you also have to look at the history, history of, of how suburbia became created. The first community of suburban houses was Levittown in Maryland. And nobody had ever built 1,500 houses to make a planned community before. And the owners who were, who were making Levittown, they got their money from the federal government. And did you know it was our federal government that said, well, we'll lend you the money to build these houses as long as you don't rent, sell to black people. So the idea that you know uh, black people might live in a lot of inner cities and less so in some suburbias, there's actually an historic connection for why that's true and how our government helped along segregation. And that book is actually called The Color of Law for Adults. And I think the author might be Levinson. I might be confusing it with Levitt. There's also a YouTube video where he speaks about the color of law. So inadequate housing, um, inadequate jobs, uh, you know, uh, last hired, first fired, then being in a neighborhood where you don't have housing that has great property taxes, then you have schools that don't make you know, don't have enough money to make great choices for their students. They just don't have the resources. And then you wonder why, you know, you are still having problems today. So there are all kinds of issues that we need to address as a society and culture, but it's not about people. And it's not about, it's not about the heart of people. All people want the same thing, uh, shelter, food, you know, and, and love. Um, and so it's also kind of like in Towers Falling when I was writing about a 9-11, I had a homeless character as a main character and her family's homeless because her father has post-traumatic stress from the falling towers and he, he, he just can't, he just can't work. And so to point out to students too and adults that the leading cause of homelessness is in fact medical bills. So when we say, oh, you're homeless, you must be lazy. Again, we're demonizing people who want the same things as all people, but we need to also recognize what are the systems that make for the oppression, uh, that make for the lack of opportunity for whatever, for whatever group you're talking about. There. <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking about Deja and just how she realizes right away in Towers Falling that her schools in the past are so different than the school she's at now. And um, 
just that she has no problem questioning that system um, and the challenges she has uh, taking care of her siblings um, yes. and the choices that she has to then make because she wants to see where the towers were. Um, and then so she decides to go see them. <laughs> yes, yes. You know, it's really interesting because I think, and this is the depth of my, of my love for my country and for being American, even though I think it's very loving to criticize what you love. You know, I heard that phrase before. Uh, we're not, we're not perfect, but I was a poor, poor kid. I didn't see the first white person of my life until I was five years old and my grandmother took me downtown. Um, my uh, mother abandoned me and went to prison when I was an eight month old, um, or at least that's what we, she didn't say she went to prison, but later on my grandmother, that's what my grandmother told me. Sometimes I still don't know what's truth or not. So my father was trying to raise me along with his sister and her kids. And she had three little kids and her husband had been killed in a bar. So my grandmother took care of five kids all under the age of five. And we were poor as church mice and right next to us was a, an abandoned yard where we had rats as big as cats. Uh, my grandmother never finished the third grade and my school teachers and librarians fed me. So I became a first generation college person. So through my education and through discovering black women write books, I changed the course of my life. I changed the course of my life, the life for my children. And my children will change the course of the life for their children. So in some sense, equitable or equal opportunity or just that grace of reaching a hand you know, to another human being can make an impact that goes on to infinity. So that's to me what life is about. And that's what I'm now trying to do with my writing, uh, speak to the power, but respectful of middle grade students in their glory. <laughs> and I, it, you do it so well. Um, I, I love reading children's literature just because it's the hard questions that get asked by kids so often. And as adults, we tend to go around it. Um, yeah. And, and your characters are always so strong. Um, well, thank you, you very much. So. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I did write 30 years for adults trying to practice to get good enough. Uh, but I still, discerning. <laughs> well, I still worry and feel insecure. But for all of you out there who are also students and you're writing essays, Essays are also like writing novels. They're also that writing and revising process. It's really all about making you more you. It's teaching and helping you to communicate best your inside self, your ideas, your feelings. So when your teacher says, you know, let's revise or we have to write another essay, Think of it as the one core skill in your life that really is not the one, not the only one, but a core skill in your life that really is the love of a teacher, an instructor saying, this is for you, kid. You're going to become more you. So be joyful. And of course, it's hard. It's supposed to be hard. Every single one of my books, I go, it's hard. And every time I finish a book, I go, oh never write another book again. And then of course I write it. Hard things in life can be good things. We learn a lot from them, but we are making ourselves new and that's how we honor each other. Um, I know um, for me, I one of the things that I have gotten from our conversation tonight is as an adult, I always need to be checking my bias. And I think that was an important message for us grownups to hear. Um, and you have said a lot of great things um, to your readers, to the students. What words would you leave them with um, if they feel maybe like Dante did at the beginning of Black Brother, Black Brother, where he feels invisible? Um, how, what, what encouragement would you give them? First of all, to realize that 
people can want to be invisible, not just because of race, you know, that sometimes our society can be so judgmental, you know, that they can be discriminatory regarding gender, they can be discriminatory regarding religion, they could be, oh, you have polka dots on you, you know, or, or you don't wear the right stylish jeans. And so that sense is, I'm going to retreat. But every time you retreat from presenting yourself to the world, you are sort of not loving yourself enough. Fundamentally, who you are in and of yourself is wonderful. And I urge you to love yourself enough to know, to say, you know what, Joe, Mary, John, you know, you know what, if you don't like this about me, tough, I don't care, you know, you're wrong. If you don't see me, you know, too bad for you. I see myself. So the judgment of others is not a good thing. The most important judgment is that you believe in yourself, that you live as a good and responsible person and you love yourself and you cut yourself some slack because sometimes you're going to do things that aren't all right, aren't you know perfect. You know, you might get a C on an essay cut yourself some slack because the great thing about it is that we are all perfectly imperfect human beings what a great way <laughs> to to wrap that up i think that's such an important lesson for kids to hear um is that we're all per imperfectly perfect <laughs> 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 are there any final thoughts you want to share before we end tonight um i just really appreciate you taking the time tonight uh to speak with us uh, i i appreciate um the invitation um very 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 much um for those of you who are growing um i want you to know that when i was a little kid um, I was, in fact, very, very shy. And when I was a little kid, I would escape into stories and escape into my imagination. So sometimes I like to think of myself, as I did at Lanisha in my novel Ninth Ward, as a butterfly. And you all know how a butterfly grows, right? It starts out as this little tiny caterpillar, you know, Eric Carl, the very hungry caterpillar. And then it goes into a cocoon. And I think middle school and high schools are part of that cocoon time. But you're always then growing and moving towards becoming a butterfly. And butterflies, though they look very fragile, and they're also very beautiful. They are among the strongest insects in the universe. So I love that idea that who I was yesterday doesn't have anything to do with who I'm gonna be in the future. I'm gonna welcome change. I'm gonna constantly evolve, knowing that along the way, where I'm gonna end up is as a strong, beautiful butterfly. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, everybody, for um, watching our conversation. Um, go to One Community Reads and see what other events are coming up. And um, thank you so much for spending time with us tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sending love out to every single one of you. And thank you very much. And let's, let's all grow together. Love you. Yes, thank bye you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.